This dim, frozen tomb carries an overwhelming feeling of oppression and death. A pale white fog wafts in the air, originating from a massive stone sarcophagus. Hey guys, welcome back to Black Magic Craft. For those of you that watched my last DM prep video, you know that I'm running Oath of the Frozen King for my new group. And for those of you wondering, session one went really good. The most surprising thing about it was just how much content the table got through. I planned a certain amount, expecting them to get through about half of it, and they got through all of it, which is kind of the opposite of most D&D games I've run. Usually we don't get through as much as I planned. They just kind of tore through it, which was really incredible and surprising for a large group of level one players, some of which who had never played together. The game actually ended after an epic battle right before the literal boss door, before the tomb of the frozen king. And that means that next session, which is in a couple days for me, is going to start with an epic boss battle. They're going to go through those doors, find a big chamber, and at the end of it is going to be this wicked-looking temple face thing with a sarcophagus and an awesome frozen king. I usually avoid building specific set pieces that are not very reusable, but in this case, I'm making an exception because I want this to be a really cool encounter. I want this to be visually memorable and also because I can justify this as a display piece for miniatures moving forward and maybe I can use it in Frostgrave. I'm using the same sort of stage piece approach that I used on my recent tavern build where it's just basically a background with just a little bit of walls, not everything. I set out building this with some of the coveted German Styroder foam. Now ever since I showed this in my video with Gerard recently. It's created a bit of ridiculous sort of sensationalism panic in the community about getting this foam in North America. Now, I don't have some amazing place for you to buy it here. I literally just had a friend send me a box of it and it was pretty expensive to do so. And I can't say I really recommend going through the effort because this foam, while definitely better at certain tasks, isn't so much better that I think it's worth going through those lengths to get. This foam actually caused me some significant problems in this build. Notably, the thinner variety of this foam comes with this sort of waffle pattern stamped on both sides of it, which means it doesn't have a smooth starting surface to work off of like the Fomular or Dow foam we get in North America does. And because I wanted a big floor piece where I could carve in the stones, I realized that the size that I wanted would be too big to run through my proxon to remove this layer. I mean, really, if you want a big open area of this, how are you supposed to remove this texture? It's not gonna fit in any normal hot wire table. So in this case, the regular stuff I used probably would have been better. Regardless, I wanted to use it, so I set out trying to find a way to tackle this problem. I landed on making my piece a bit smaller, and I first cut a base in the shape I wanted out of medium weight chipboard. Then using some thicker styrodur, I ended up cutting some strips that would serve as the floor pieces. I made two of them of different thicknesses to create a little bit of a step. I used Super 77 spray adhesive on the chipboard to attach the foam. This provides an instant bond with no risk of warping. I cut off the excess foam using my Proxon, using the attached chipboard as a guide. Now, you may be wondering why I'm doing it with the chipboard on the bottom where I can't see it. This is for a good reason, as it creates a much better, more plumb cut. I actually explain and demonstrate this in detail in one of my previous videos, which I will link above. I used my usual tinfoil ball method to add some stone texture to the foam before carving in my design. Using a sharp pencil, I started freehand drawing an interlocking brick pattern. The pencil technique allows for intricate patterns that can be very difficult to achieve with my usual individual brick method. In all honesty, 
I instantly regretted this and remembered why I stopped doing it years ago. While it certainly has its advantages, it's so incredibly tedious. You could argue laying individual bricks is just as tedious, but I personally enjoy that process more, so it doesn't feel as arduous to me. I also found that this foam, while denser and better at taking texture, still didn't make this process that much easier than it is on the pink formula I usually use. It still wanted to tear on some lines and still would spring back more than I'd like. Without question, this foam is better for creating layered effects like peeling stucco on a wall or embedded timber, but for general brickwork, I only found it to be marginally better, and I think if I were to do this again, I'd revert to my usual method, at least for the floor. What I'm getting at is that every technique and every material has its advantages and disadvantages, and if you can't get Styroder, stop worrying about it, don't stress about it, you're not missing out on that much. It's definitely better for some things, but it's also worse for others, so just use the material that you have and just worry about building things. I wanted to create a gothic style archway for the back wall, something that looked a bit like a church but with a solid stone instead of stained glass. I decided to first make a template out of construction paper to work out the design and use that as a guide. I used the Shifting Lands arch template to lay out the shape of the arches, and I knew I wanted this wall to be in two layers to create some depth. So before cutting out the inner parts of the arches, I transferred the outer shape to my foam pieces while the cardstock was more stable. Then using an X-Acto knife, I cut out the shape. Personally, I actually find it easier to cut out shapes like this on thinner foam with a knife than with a hot wire, as it allows a bit more control and removes the risk of overcutting or over melting the foam where lines meet. I then transferred the shape to another piece of foam for the back piece and repeated the cutout. Having the perimeter of the two pieces cut, I could safely remove the inner arches of the template and transfer that layout to my front piece of foam and cut out the intersections. That's kind of a mouthful. What I'm getting at here is that that template, and yes, I say template, not template, because I'm Canadian, the outer shape, if I were to cut out those inner arches, it would make it all wobbly and weird and hard to transfer. So I cut out the perimeter first while it was stable, then went back, cut out the interior arches, removed them, and laid it on and carefully removed them. Does that, does that make sense? I drew in my grout lines on my paper first to see how it looks. I always struggle with these layouts, so I pulled up a real world reference photo on my phone to give me an idea of where the grout lines would actually land on this sort of arch. I had to take some liberties on the lower portion since I'd created an unusual situation where three arches intersect side by side sharing stones. And I straight up couldn't find a real world example of this sort of situation. To be safe, I used a Sharpie to first lay out my pattern on the foam before making the actual cuts. Once I was content with my layout, I used my X-Acto knife again to carefully make shallow cuts on the grout lines. I didn't want to use just a pencil as this would cause too much tearing on the delicate piece, especially where the lines wrapped around the corners to the other edges. After that, I was able to go in with a blunt pencil and create some stone texture and round the grout lines. I textured the back wall with a basic stone pattern before gluing the two layers together with tacky glue. I created little sidewalls out of low strips of foam. I didn't want this to be too tall, just tall enough to imply visually what the space looked like. I made these walls out of one solid piece of foam and artificially created the two layers of brick by carefully cutting away sections of brick from the front and the back. I also tapered the walls towards the floor to create the transition between the wall and invisible wall. While I would be leaving the back face of the walls blank, I needed to make sure the tops looked good, so I added texture and grout lines to the top edges of the back wall. I made use of the seam between the two layers of foam and treated that like the brick separation, hiding the seam in plain sight. The inner areas of the arches were a little too boring, so I went in with a sharp pencil and drew some random lines and runes to give the area an ominous magical look. After all the tedious carving and drawing was complete, I could finally assemble the walls. I decided to use hot glue for this. While PVA is typically a cleaner glue to use, I did not trust it in this case. The back wall didn't sit perfectly flat on the base, so I needed a strong glue that would instantly hold it in place and resist the bit of pressure needed to make the two pieces fully bond. Hot glue was the best option in this case, but it required being rather careful not to create a mess of excess on the joint.
With my three walls in place, I could clean up the back with some construction paper. I really like this approach because it gives a clean, simple look to the outside areas, and it also serves to make the joints even stronger as it ties the two pieces together across the seam. Usually, I would do this with Super 77 spray adhesive, but I decided to try Mod Podge. This was a mistake. While Mod Podge is meant to bond paper to objects, it dries far too slowly for this sort of task, and I found it difficult to keep even pressure on the piece as it dried. The last step of day one on this build was giving the foam my usual coating of black magic base coat. This is just my simple mix of matte Mod Podge and black paint to harden the foam and bond any loose areas. It's important to note that when I do this, I also coat the back paper and the underside of the chipboard to completely seal the whole piece and protect it from moisture during the wash stage. On day two of the project, I tackled the paint. This started with a thin coat of black paint. This provides a much nicer surface to paint on than the Mod Podge alone, which is still a little glossy. For painting terrain, the flatter your base coat, the easier the next steps will be. And I find that cheap Apple Barrel Black is the flattest paint around. I wanted to keep this color scheme simple and wanted it to match my existing frost grave tiles. Normally, I advise using some warm earth tones for stonework to make them look more natural, but in this case, the stone is supposed to look cold and a simple gray palette actually works best. I gave the entire piece a base coat of dark gray craft paint. I kept my brush damp during the process to help the paint flow into all of the crevices. Once that was thoroughly dry, I moved on to dry brushing with a medium gray. Again, cheap craft paint, and I used a dollar store makeup brush to apply it. I really like these big, puffy, cheap brushes for dry brushing large areas. I did the same process with vanilla or off-white, using the same brush without washing it in between. This time around, I only did about 50% of the coverage compared to the medium gray. Now it was time for the black wash. I had just mixed up a fresh batch of my homemade wash and I'll put a link to that video in the top corner if you want the recipe. I see a lot of people get freaked out after they apply their wash that it made their piece look too dark. That's sort of the point, that, that's what it does. A wash doesn't only darken the low spots, it acts as a filter over everything. It's important to know this and keep it in mind when doing your initial paint work. You want your piece to be way lighter than you want the final piece to be before hitting it with a black wash. After some experience, you will start to get a natural feel for this while painting and be able to predict how the wash will filter the colors. And at the end of the day, you can always do another light dry brushing of white or gray after the wash dries to bring back some of those muted highlights. Now, to give this an added icy effect, I decided to make some icicles. I opted to use UV resin for this because it's really easy using this little bottle to draw out tiny icicles on some parchment paper. After a quick cure with a UV flashlight, they can be peeled off the paper and put aside to use. This creates a really nice, clear, and durable set of icicles. Now, you don't have to use resin. You can absolutely do this with hot glue. You do need a fine tip on your glue gun and some practice, but you can create very similar results this way. It's a little bit tougher to get them as thin and they won't be quite as clear, but they will work just fine. And you can also cut them down with a knife after to make them any smaller size you want. Even with the resin ones, I don't like the little round ball at the tops on some of them, so I just cut those off before applying them. The other great thing about using resin is that you can use that resin as an instant glue to attach them to the project. This works even faster than super glue and it won't haze over. You can even use more resin to create bigger icy or melting type effects right onto the piece. Now for the fun part, the snow. This is something I really enjoy doing, but typically avoid because it makes the piece far less modular and reusable, 
So I was excited to do it here. I approach this in much the same way I approach moss. I mix snow flocking with an adhesive that dries clear. You can use PVA, Mod Podge, or even varnish. I chose Gloss Mod Podge as it is cheap and strong and will add a nice bit of gloss to the piece, which I think is appropriate for melting snow. I diluted the Mod Podge with water down to a milk-like consistency and added my snow flock. I mostly used Woodland Scenics for this, but also added in some from Green Stuff World since their snow flocking actually has a really nice glittery effect that the Woodland Scenic stuff is missing. This mix needs to be wet enough that the snow slightly sags under its own weight. This will help it appear more like actual snow. If it's too dry, it will look coarse and bumpy, and piles of snow in real life generally don't look like that. You want to be able to slop it on and have it sort of settle into a somewhat smooth mound. After putting down the big piles, I spread it out a bit with a brush to give the appearance that the snow had blown into place. One thing to keep in mind when doing effects like this is that while wet, the adhesive is white, so it looks a lot more extreme wet than it will when it dries. All of those thin areas will mostly dry clear with just a little bit of the actual flocking staying visible. Just like the wash and painting process, this takes some experience to be able to trust yourself and be able to estimate how things are going to look after they dry. I gotta say, I'm really glad I built this piece. It's gonna be very exciting to run an encounter with it as a backdrop, and after that, it's gonna make a nice bit of display for some of my miniatures. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, hit the like button and let me know in the comments section. If you wanna pick up any tools or supplies for your builds, head over to blackmagiccraft.ca. There I have an essential equipment page where I list and explain and link to all of the stuff I use regularly. If you're new around here, don't forget to hit subscribe. Check out my back catalog. I got tons of other build videos and crafting related videos. I put one out each and every Friday and I've been doing that for over three years. If you get a lot of value out of these videos that I make, if you've been watching for a long time, maybe they've helped you pick up a new hobby, saved you some money, or helped bring your family together for a fun activity, consider supporting Black Magic Craft on Patreon. It's the support there that allows me to keep making these videos for the community, and I'd love to have you as the newest member of the Black Magic Craft Fellowship. And for those of you that are wondering where I got this sweet Frozen King miniature that totally perfectly represents the art from the module, seriously, it's got the crown, it's got the mall, it's perfect. This is from Crippled God Foundry. I did a review video for them when they were launching one of their Kickstarters, and this is from that campaign. Don't think it's available in retail yet. It was from a Kickstarter that I think is still being fulfilled, but Crippled God Foundry are the makers of this mini if you want to look into them. That's it for this one, guys. I will see you again next week. And uh, wish my players luck. I think this is going to be a difficult encounter. Cheers.